Dr. Kevin DeCock, uh, a friend and colleague who is moderating today's panel discussion. He's a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians in the United Kingdom. Among other honors, Dr. DeCock was formerly the director of CDC Center for Global Health, the director of CDC's programs in Kenya, and the CDC Ebola response and team lead in Liberia and Democratic Republic of Congo. I can go on and on to uh, acknowledge this young gentleman. Um, but you should get a first hand of his uh, uh, idea of his experience in his new book, Dispatches from the AIDS Pandemic, a public health story available from Oxford University Press. Since his retirement from CDC in 2020, Dr. Cock has been working as an independent consultant and teaching at University of Oxford, UK, and the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp, Belgium. Over to you, Kevin. Thank you very much for the kind words, John. We are running a bit behind. I wonder if I could ask the panelists to come to the table. Dr. Uh, Jacob Cresswell uh, uh, began his career at CDC on TV and HIV. Years ago, worked for WHO. Currently, uh, coordinates Stop TB's uh, TB uh, focused on improving programmatic aspects of TB case detection outcomes. Um, it's a program that actually has provided more than $180 million of support to partners in uh, 56 countries. And he also supports the um, work in the UN UNITAID funded uh, Start for All initiative. Uh, dealing with, uh, focusing on uh, point of care diagnostics. Um, so he's uh, he's an expert on different aspects of TB case detection uh, and uh, evaluation of new diagnostics and screening tools. Um, so we're going to go very quickly, we have about 20 minutes for this panel. So please keep the answers to the point and, and brief. Um, the background, we had a wonderful presentation from Bob Horsberg uh, focusing on TB disease. What the panel is going to focus on uh, broader, but it's going to focus particularly on TB preventive therapy, pediatric TB, uh, diagnostics, and community engagement. Um, a lot of discussion so far on the treatment of active cases of tuberculosis, but about 25% of the world's population are infected with tuberculosis, not necessarily sick from it. About 10% of them are expected to develop disease at some time. And one of the strategies is to prevent that happening. So my first question uh, is going to be, uh, how do we, on the background of renewed WHO guidance a few years ago, and recently the high-level panel meeting at, uh, at uh, the United Nations just uh, a few days ago, um, how do we increase access in uh, how do we how do we get programs to focus more and better on um, implementation of preventive therapy for groups at risk? Um, uh, Jacob, we haven't heard from you yet, so do you want to comment on that? Sure. Um, thank you. And thanks for the opportunity to talk. I, I think you know in, in the UN panel and at the UN high-level meeting in 2018 uh, and the political declaration, there was three target uh, groups that that were looked at. And one of them was people living to HIV, one of them was childhood contacts, one of them was uh, adult contacts. Mm -hmm. And the HIV targets have been met uh, and exceeded and the and were woefully uh, below the targets for for children and household contacts. And I, I think the easiest thing to point to is the fact that PEPFAR, which is currently being uh, debated in in the halls of Congress, um, is was in, in, had a huge impact and 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 was able to to get people on treatment because that's what they were focused on. Uh, and I think we need more of those kind of efforts and and frankly funding for uh, for for the other groups. That's a a very big picture answer. I think one of the challenges also is it's it's always difficult to get people who are asymptomatic and well to do anything uh, like taking treatment and so on. Vanessa, let, let me ask you, and I'm, I'm glad you gave a bit of history of Geskio. Gesk, it was, and for those who, I think many people here probably know Bill Pop, but really if there was a Nobel Prize in public health, I think he'd be one of the 
for it. Um, um, and Geskio and Bill was actually one of the, the first, I think, uh, published the first paper on preventive therapy in HIV a long time ago now. Um, so you've talked a lot about community. What do you think we can do to get communities to accept preventive therapy for tuberculosis? You talked about outreach for diagnosis and so on, but what about preventive therapy? I think it's it's very difficult, actually. Um, like Jacob said, um, we we met our targets for HIV population because two reasons. We had a big machine pushing it, the PEPFAR machine, which has been tr tremendously successful. And you already have people that are taking medication, right? They're taking HIV medication. You're just adding on another pill. They might not like the pill burden. But then we're talking about people who are asymptomatic, um, mothers who have to come in, get their children evaluated and give pills to children who need adult supervision for it. So if we do not have um, community engagement, it's not going to happen. We, we've seen it. The uptake of INH prophylaxis for pediatric household contacts, less than five people will start, but not 15% will complete the six months. Uh, I think we really need to rethink uh, the strategy and really come in from the participant, the community perspective. There's a couple of uh, qualitative research that's going on, linking mothers and children and really getting their inputs. But I think it's going to have to be not physician driven. I think you should take this to what do I need to protect my children? A little bit, maybe it's not the best example, but a little bit like why do people bring in their children for vaccination? Because We've convinced them somehow there's a message out there that it's beneficial for their health. We need to have it that women will, or parents, I shouldn't say women, but to the fathers out there, but that parents would want to bring in their children for preventative therapy. And I don't, I think if we don't have that change in communication and that change in engagement, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to have great success at least. Uh, certainly shorter regimens will help. If you're convincing someone to give medicine for six months on a daily basis to a six month old, I think it's a lost cause au uh, depot. Yeah, there's sort of three aspects to, to these sorts of discussions. There's the technical, what drugs do you use? There's the program and there's, you know, what does the program do? And there's the community aspect. So let me ask you, Dr. Banu, in those WHO revised recommendations, the, the consolidated guidelines from 2021, I think it was, um, they actually do talk about shorter regimens for preventive therapy, uh, a month of uh, rifapentine and INH, uh, four months of rifampicin. Uh, do you think this is realistic for a country like Bangladesh? Okay, before I uh, go to that point, uh, as both of them has mentioned, and Jacob is actually, you know, smiling. So in, in a country like Bangladesh, uh, we are talking about community, but even at the uh, service provider level, they are not convinced, you know. So I think it's very important for TB preventive therapy to be implemented. You have to have a very good system uh, by the National TB Control Program. And uh, even sometimes when we have convinced the doctors, we find that there is shortage of medicine. You know, we started with this like, you know, rifapentine and this short course, but when the doctors were convinced, then there is no medicine, you know, to provide that. This is one issue. Another issue is like for, uh, unlike, you know, TB treatment, we do not have any dots for TPT yet. I mean, it is not recommended, I think, WHO. So that is another issue, that how you can actually convince a healthy, apparently, of course, I mean, apparently it's the healthy people to continue that medicine and to let them know what is the importance of taking that medicine. So I think in, in a country like Bangladesh, these are the challenges. And again, another challenge is like, how do you... Uh, screen those because you have to screen out like active TB. So in a country like Bangladesh, as I have like 
shown you, even the extra facilities are, you know, not available everywhere. Even the radiologists, they are not very good at that. So I think a lot of, you know, issues, but in terms of that, you know, short course, of course, I mean, this is better than the six months, you know, regimen that we use for the children and we use for the children. But, but I think there are other issues, you know, behind that too, really. Yeah, six, you know, if you come from the HIV world, um, the HIV world sort of looks at TB and says, well, it's only six months, you know. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> sort of, Jacob, to have the last word on this, um, one of the, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Banu mentioned getting providers to accept all of this. And the one thing you always hear is, well, this will lead to drug resistance. I mean, that's the biggest complaint from the medical practitioners what and yet where do you stand on this and what's what, what do you think and what's the evidence that uh, that actually this is not a problem and that we can implement this safely uh, that's a that's a yes we we definitely hear it i i i think convincing the provider people generally listen to their providers uh not always uh but a, a, a someone a, a provider who is convinced that it's the good thing to do can um, convince people. A test that shows you have infection at least will will be uh, helpful. And the tests now that we have are complicated and expensive and not great. And so um, what that does is it, it pushes a lot of uh, empirical treatment, right? And, and, and then you have this concern where are we over treating and are we treating people who actually might have disease with a only one or two drugs and so that you create drug resistance my personal um feeling on this is that the large numbers of people the, the, the numbers of people that if you did a, a large scale intervention you can ideally drive down um uh, uh incidents and a uh, new disease a lot more than you're going to be over treating a few people who have active disease, maybe incipient TB that could be treated. I, it's a it's a I, it's a personal thing. I do not think I think we have a lot of other drivers of drug resistance that um, TB infection is not uh, going to large scale treatment of TB infection is not going to uh, make too much worse. That's my interesting to reflect actually on I mean, uh, Bob mentioned in his talk the Alaska experience of treatment of course there's an enormous Alaska experience of preventive therapy which is extremely oh. instructive and it's kind of interesting to reflect that we're sort of living like a giant wheel in tuberculosis with you know emphasis now on population screening which used to get done years and years ago and then was abandoned and in fact sort of population-wide consideration of much wider use of preventive therapy. So um, yeah, there's the sort of nothing new under the sun. <laughs> um, pediatric TB. So Vanessa, um, what, I mean, and, and you, you meant, you obviously talked a little bit about it in, in your presentation, but in Haiti, what do you think is the way forward for pediatric TB? What are your aspirations? What are you lacking mainly that would make a difference? I think pediatric TB is complicated. Um, it's certainly worse in countries that have very weak health infrastructures like Haiti. Um, even in the best systems, like in the US, children will often go multiple visits before someone clues on that this is tuberculosis. Uh, so the way forward, I think, has to be multi-pronged. We need to be driving down transmission at the uh, adult level at the household. If we have tens of thousands of adults coughing off in their babies' faces, I, I think th that differential is so big that it's going to help. Uh, we need to be tr identifying and treating the adults. We're often, it's the children that will present, like in the video that Dr. Banu was showing, that after we identify the baby, we figure out that there's an adult in the household. We need to be doing better at figuring out that there's an adult and offering uh, preventative therapy to their children instead of the other way around. You know, the classic is the baby comes in with miliary TB. 
uh, dies within, you know, a few weeks in the hospital, and then somebody clues in, oh, well, the dad has been coughing at home for four months. Um, so we really need to be, I think, doing better with our adults. Um, and we need to find that holy grail for pediatric TB, but we're not there yet. We're hoping we're going to be exhaling soon, and that breath testing might be promising, uh, but um, we're, we're not quite there yet. Um, in the meantime, I think it's just continuing with what we have, which is better education and um, uh, preventative therapy. We're, we're really not doing well with household contacts. And unlike what's been done with PEPFAR, I think there can be a focused international strategic plan to do what PEPFAR has done for uh, TBT in HIV for household contacts. I think if we increase active case finding and we really ramp up the numbers on TPT and household contacts, which would obviously target children and pregnant women, um, I think it would make a significant dent in the curve. It wouldn't fix it, but it would certainly I mean, help. it's critically important to remember that a child with tuberculosis was infected by somebody else and an adult. Children in general do not transmit tuberculosis only to a very limited degree. That's true. Um, and Dr. Barnett, thinking again about diagnostics, um, could you comment a little bit about stool diagnosis, which I think you talked about a little, you mentioned earlier. Um, I, I, I mean, this is this is a fairly recent uh, sort of uh, uh, development. Um, I remember it being said to me once that a uh, long time ago that if the cure for cancer was to be found in stool, we'd never find it. Because <laughs> obviously it's a specimen that there has been reluctance to work with. Um, that's putting it mildly. <laughs> uh, could you comment on combinations of tests that might help us? Um, what's currently available for children or for adults? And secondly, where your hopes for the future are in terms of development of diagnostics, better diagnostics? Uh Yes, I mean, stool expert is good, but at the same time, I think um, it's not that straightforward because the the result I have shown, actually, this is not the method that is, you know, WHO has recommended because this is a one-step method and we actually do, you know, centrifugation. So we concentrate the, you know, the supernatant. So, but at least we have something in hand because children cannot, you know, produce putamses, so they swallow, so it goes, you know, through. So this is one thing in, in our case, it's the positivity rate is like around 4.5%. So this is, I would say this is actually, you know, great. At least we have something. But as we have mentioned, I mean, TB diagnostics, we need uh, a lot to do. We need something, you know, uh, at least for the children. Like today in the morning, there were a like, discussion that uh, uh, the two of the like options that point of care test using this blood, you know, it's very simple, but I think it has some promises. So uh, we need we need something like that or like breath test. I don't know this yet to go because it's only now, you know, tested in. Adults in children, we don't know, especially under five. Uh, but we, I think there are a number of, you know, potential diagnostics at this the very early stage. But we need to actually work more, you know, faster. We need more funds to do. I don't know why, because tuberculosis has been an ancient disease for long, long. But we don't know why we are very slow to, you know, do more to improve you know, the diagnostic, because I know that his vaccine is the only, you know, uh, solution to completely eradicate TB. Vaccine, we, we are not actually far behind, you know, to developing a vaccine. But diagnostic, again, I think we should do more. Uh, I mean, absolutely, if we really want to control TB from the world, I don't know how many more years we'll, you know, need uh, 
uh, to eradicate TB from the world, you know. Uh, so in my opinion, I think we should have more research on the diagnostics to have a like, you know, easy point of care. Jacob, do you, you know, in the world of HIV, thinking of vaccines since you mentioned them, there's been a lot of debate as to whether the constraints are funding or technical, you know, biological. I lean towards saying actually in HIV, it's it's the technical problem, it's the biological problem. It's not money that's stopping us getting an HIV vaccine. Jacob, if you if you you know ask the same question about diagnostics for tuberculosis, including development of point of care diagnostics, which in HIV really have been quite revolutionary. Um where do you think the, uh, the you know the choke point is? Is it money or is it uh, technology? And if you could do whatever you want in this area, what would you advise? I think that we have seen so for a hundred years we used mirror microscopy, and then uh, expert came along two thousand ten ish, and it was. Uh, Everyone was very excited, myself included. Uh, it hasn't changed massively. I mean, it hasn't really impacted the numbers of people that are are put on treatment. It's helped with drug-resistant detection, and it's helped with bacteriological confirmation. And I think that going back to the earlier question uh, that Syra was talking about, we have all these potential tests. Uh, stool and urine and and maybe breath and none of them are great and what really will change what we see has changed is having clinicians being confident enough to diagnose tb without uh, a test result in especially in children so i i do think that that especially with children, the ability to clinically diagnose in the absence of a, a really great test, which we're waiting for, is, is probably the most impactful thing that we can do. We have seen now in the last, just in the last few years, with all of the interest that has gone into COVID, uh, some of that is trickling down and, and, and we're getting platforms uh, that have invested a lot of, of money and and time and now they're now they're they're looking for the next thing and one of them could be tb and that the platforms are developed and I, I so i do think that money is is clearly needed uh, but we have really struggled with with uh sputum is is difficult other other uh samples are have proved very, very difficult. So I do, I, I do think that money is is probably um, critical, but it's not, it's not sufficient. Uh, and there are still quite a few technical challenges uh, around different biomarkers that we oh, are looking at. I would conclude from your answer that both. It's, it's both. <laughs> I, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I, I would agree, but <laughs> I think we, we're not allowed to say that it's technical yet, considering that we've spent 10% of the money that we spent on HIV. We've spent billions on HIV in 40 years, and we haven't spent 10% of that in the centuries worth of TB. So I think once we meet that funding match, then we can say we're technically <laughs> challenged because it's the chicken and the egg, right? Like the technology needs the money to be driven. Those, I think, I think that's those are. I think both your comments are very uh, apropos. Um, we're running out of time. Um, I want to make a comment and allow you the last word. Um, two comments. Uh, one, very interestingly, a former director of CDC, uh, Jim Mason. He's now the late Jim Mason. Many years ago, he he was asked to speak to a TB controllers meeting in the United States, and they sort of expected, you know, the usual well done, good work, carry on. And he absolutely lambasted them for the reason you said, Jacob, that he said, you're, you know, this is an ancient disease and you're using 19th century technology with smear microscopy. Uh, you know, you're absolutely no further on and this is disgraceful. And they were utterly shocked. And we have made progress, but as you say, less than you think. And I, I'm struck that there are certain diseases and I would say 
tuberculosis, syphilis, and cholera that actually represent more than just a disease. They're sort of an indicator of societal malfunction, of, uh, of inequities, and really just lack of commitment uh, and a whole lot of, of other stuff. Um, but those three diseases, and I mean, syphilis is another thing. I, I wish the Fondation actually would do something on syphilis, including from a diagnostic perspective. Anyway, that's a comment. Um, final words to you. Um, just a, a quick sentence, we have to finish. Uh, Thyra, if um, one wish for TB, you're Mr. Gates now. <laughs> I just like, I have been working, you know, for 30 years, but it's really very unfortunate that very little, you know, improvement has been made actually to, in order to eradicate or control TB. So I really want to see during my lifetime that. TB is no more a public health issue. Thank you. Uh, I I would say that before long before we had um, treatment for TB, death rates were coming down uh, globally or places that they were being tracked. And uh, this is because TB is and the diseases that you you mentioned uh, incredibly linked to poverty. And there's a there is real reasons why HIV, SARS, COVID uh, get the attention. Other diseases get the attention, and TB doesn't. And unfortunately, a lot of them are linked to who's getting it and where they're getting it. And and that's because generally it, it's poor uh, black and brown people. Uh, and the 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 focus has to be on a larger uh social determinants and and not only medical interventions and the new tests which we all find really interesting to look at but it's a bigger picture than 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 just uh tools vanessa the last word always use the last word when you if you're given the opportunity <laughs> i would say we need a pepfar mechanism for tv uh it rallies the political will, the political obligation, the commitments, the funding support. It We have moved mountains with PEPFAR and we've accomplished the incredible feat. And I think it's time that we would have something like that that would rally countries and we don't need to wait for the Holy Grail. We have enough as it is. We just need to put our heads together and get it done. Please thank this excellent panel.